Hello, everyone. It's Diana here. And in the next couple of minutes, as you can tell, we're going to talk about living on the edge with CI/CD. So I'm sure most of you remember those vintage TVs with bump screens, a lot of buttons, and sometimes without even a remote control. I'm also sure that most of you are asked to stand up and turn on the TV or switch to another channel because, you know, you are the youngest in the room, so the pleasure is yours. Not only those two, but I'm also sure you are in a situation when you're comfortable on your bed and you realize you forgot to turn off the lights. But at the same time, you know the feeling of trying to find your bed in the dark room after turning the lights off from the switch on the wall. Today, you don't have to experience these things anymore. You can simply ask Alexa or a Google Home device to do this for you. The solution to all these basic but painful problems that we just saw, as well as solutions to much more complex problems, lay within the domain of IoT. From something that was never heard of a decade ago, IoT has become one of the hottest technology terms today. So we are talking about IoT, but let's first see what it actually is. The Internet of Things is a giant network of connected things and people, all of which collect and share data about the way they are used and about the environment around them. That includes an extraordinary number of objects of all shapes and sizes. For example, we have self-driving cars whose complex sensors detect objects in their path. We even have connected footballs that can track how far and fast they're thrown and record those statistics via an app for future training purposes, for example. Basically, a thing in the Internet of Things can even be a person with a heart monitor implant or an automobile that has built-in sensors to alert the driver when the tire pressure is low or any other natural or man-made object. So as soon as we can assign an IP address to a thing and it's able to transfer data over a network, it's part of IoT and can be called an edge device. And now that we have seen what IoT is, I want quick, to quickly go through uh, a number of interesting facts. So let's start with that the majority of people, actually 87% of them, haven't even heard of the term IoT. So congratulations, you are the other 13% of the people around the world. Now let, let's take a look back 13 years ago, in 2008, when there were already more objects connected to the internet than people. And a bit further back in time, when we had the first ever connected IoT device, which was actually the ATM. I think that was enough for the past. Let's take a look at 2025 in three years from now, when the number of IoT devices is expected to rise to 75 billion. IoT is such a big thing nowadays that it's considered to be a vital component of a humankind industry revolution. Today, we're experiencing a new era of industrialization, what will be referred to in the history books as the fourth industrial revolution. But let's have a quick look at the previous ones. The first industrial revolution started at the end of 18th century, and the biggest changes came in the industries in the form of mechanization. Following the first, the second, um, go through the, uh, we, we go through the second almost a century later. It started at the end of 19th century with massive technological advancements, the creation of the automobile and the plane, for instance. And to this day, the second industrial revolution is considered the most important one. The third industrial revolution, also known as the digital one, occurred after the end of two world wars. It's characterized by the spread of automation and digitalization through the use of electronics and computers, also the invention of the internet and the discovery, the discovery of nuclear energy. So here we come to the fourth industrial revolution, which is the ongoing automation of the traditional manufacturing and industrial practices using modern smart technology. 
It's a way of describing the blurring of boundaries between the physical, digital, and the biological worlds. It's a fusion of advances in AI, robotics, the IoT, 3D printing, quantum computing, virtual and augmented reality, and much more. As a global company, ACP has announced Industry for Now. And this is a strategic investment to help customers transform their manufacturing businesses. Our strategy goes well beyond smart manufacturing in factories and plants. It connects production with end-to-end -end process execution across the supply chain. So you can reach a new level of connectivity and adapt to change on the fly. One of the new innovations that I personally want to focus on are the intelligent factories and the distributed edge computing. Currently, I'm part of the edge lifecycle management team, as we said previously, and our product provides a shipment channel for SAP cloud um, products to deliver and manage containerized SAP workloads to edge computing sites. The product is open to all SAP cloud-based applications. It offers a convenient way to standardize the entire software lifecycle for edge usage. And we're also using software architecture like the modern one and industry standards like Kubernetes and Docker containers. We chose Kubernetes because in this way we have more control and we actually don't care what, what the client's hardware is as soon as it has Kubernetes on top. For us, the environment is all the same. On top of that, zero downtime deployments, fault tolerance, high availability, scaling and self-healing add significant value in Kubernetes. And that, after that, the customers can add, can add their edge computing sites in their customer tenants. And these edge sites can run selected native containerized applications. Then users can manage centrally multiple edge factory sites, including the SAP software lifecycle. So if I have to summarize the goal of the fourth industrial revolution, it's simply to remove the human workers from the factories and automate the work with robots. And this is exactly the goal also for the customers of our product. So here is an example of how one edge device actually looks like. This edge device is actually an Azure Stack edge device. So you basically purchase it and rent it from Microsoft and pay some monthly bills. This means if something happens with the hardware, you're not responsible for that, and Microsoft should take care of it. After receiving it, you just need to set up it by their guidelines, and that's it. After that, we as a team are thinking about this device as a simple Kubernetes cluster. And it's important to say that the edge device is basically an extension of the cloud. On the other hand, the clients basically need to add this edge node via simple UI, download and run a bootstrapping tool and initiate a cloud connector. Then an automatic deployment starts and initiates the edge lifecycle management tool that we develop. Finally, a deployment of the desired software components happens in the cloud application that should be available on the edge nodes, and this is it. Now the customers can monitor and manage their edge devices. There is also one important thing here that I would like to mention and it is regarding the data. So as I said earlier, the edge device is more like an extension of the cloud and there is no critical data on it. All the data is backed up on the cloud. Of course, there is other use cases for edge applications. Although the underlying infrastructure is a key enabler, the benefits of edge computing are realized through the applications. If done right, edge applications can enable new experiences across a range of industries. For example, healthcare, to integrate live data from patients or autonomous driving where self-driving cars can use real-time data to safely drive on the road. On top of that, we have the smart infrastructure where cities can leverage real-time data from roadside sensors and cameras in order to improve traffic and safety. But since we are in edge environment, what's really important, we have to say. So first of all, you need to keep it simple because the edge computing is where the real work gets done. In many of these locations, the environments are extreme and basic connectivity and power aren't always available. 
For instance, there are edge devices in the oceans that, me um, that measure the surface of the water and how it moves in order to inform people to evacuate and save their lives from potential tsunami waves. As important as keeping it simple is that the environment should be easily scalable and expandable. Regular deployments and exponential data growth are the reasons why the edge infrastructure has to be designed to accommodate that growth and expand and upgrade with new resources and applications as easily as the initial deployment. Moreover, and perhaps the most important consideration is the flexibility. To avoid becoming a nightmare, edge systems should have the flexibility to be deployed into any environment on any hardware and be installed with little or no customization. Edge deployments should be conceived from the start with an approach to simplicity, cost effectiveness, as, and as I said, flexibility. In the DevOps world, the, term conti the terms continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment are quite common. But what's also quite common is that these terms are used interchangeably, often as synonyms. Even though all of them are part of the software delivery process, each has its own requirements and more importantly, benefits. And understanding these differences is the first step in properly implementing them. But what are the differences and how do the different approaches fit into the development process? They take place in this order with continuous integration being the foundation the others need. In other words, it's simply not a good practice to implement continuous delivery without properly implementing continuous integration first. So with that in mind, let's look at the differences. Continuous integration is the practice where developers merge the changes to the code base to the main branch as often as possible. These changes are validated by creating a build and then running some automated tests against this build. If these tests don't pass, the changes aren't merged and developers avoid integration challenges that can happen. And the benefits of CI, yeah, this process also causes your bugs to be shipped to production as the issues are caused early and integration issues are solved before the release. Then we come to the continuous delivery, which is an extension of CI, since it enables automation to deploy all the code changes to an environment after the changes have been merged. The artifact may be built as part of CI or as part of this process, since the source of truth is reliably given your CI process. This means that there is an automated release process and that developers can deploy their changes at any time by simply clicking a button or at the completion of CI. Since developers can deploy their changes at any time, it's recommended to deploy the changes to production as often as possible. This is making the troubleshooting easier and provides your users, your users with the last version of the product. Oftentimes, the release to production may be managed by a release manager. By enabling this non-technical team member to control this process, you can reduce the burden on the development team so they may continue to execute on further application improvements and developments. So continuous deployment take this process one step further than continuous delivery. Here, all the changes that pass the verification steps at each stage in the pipeline are released to production. This process is completely automated and only a failed verification step will prevent pushing the changes to production. Apart from the fact that customers get updates quicker, developers also get feedback faster, which means small changes at less pressure. In order to successfully accomplish continuous deployments, tracking metrics around mean time to repair and change failure rate is critical to the success of fully automated deployments. So if we are talking about edge environments and CI-CD, then it's extremely important to keep your CI-CD system highly secure. This is because the infrastructure has access to many different resources from the development and production environments. And let's start with defining strict user policies and access roles for the team of developers to avoid conflicts and unnecessary actions. For example, it will be mistakenly pushing confidential files also defining rules in the code repository via strategies like git ignore is like a best practice. The next step is to also make sure the code 
the programming language and the used software are upgraded to their latest releases. This ensures better performance with the latest security patches and updates from the respective platform or software vendors. So as you can see in the picture, after executing the units and the integration tests, it's like a best practice to execute the security scans and analysis before the deployment to a system. Static analysis checks um, a static analysis checks the code for software vulnerabilities and coding errors. Alongside identifying violations in coding best practices, and they also detect security vulnerabilities in the code, oftentimes even in the libraries imported. Now, I would like to give you some practical example and show you our different components and their respective security scans. So, we have Docker images as well as Kubernetes operators, both Java and Golang applications. And finally, a UI5 application written in JavaScript. But let's first see what actually are the purposes of these security scans that I'm talking about. The first thing is to audit open source software compliance and vulnerabilities in third party code. Also to provide license information and publicly known security vulnerabilities for the identified open source software libraries. Not only those two, but as I said earlier, we have many Docker containers. So in order to follow the recommendations of the best practices for writing Docker files, we are using a linter tool. In order to be security compliant and do all that stuff, and we are using a bunch of tools. For example, a black duck, a black duck binary analysis tool, a white source, Fortify, check marks, Hadolint, and a lot more. All these are maybe a small part of all the security tools that the world can provide us. But this is one example of how we as a team working on the edge are doing it. All right, so as we are moving to the end of the presentation, let's take a look at a couple future trends for DevOps and CICD. As you all know, unfortunately, last two years, we have been living in a pandemic situation and a lot of the employers had to let their employees work from home. As you can see, all of us today are also doing our presentations from home. So the conferences are also being changed. This remote working highlighted the need to move away from the traditional security model to a user-based and device-based authentication and authorization model. In the coming years, we will probably still see this hybrid model with few days working from home and few days from the office. Essentially, teams will split their time between remotely and in-house, making a zero trust approach even more critical. When it comes to CICD specifically, the build phase continues to be a new hotspot for security risks, especially given the exponential data growth of open source software. Addressing security early on can help make security cheaper and safer. And this is going to become even more important in the coming years. Another trend is directly linked to the business results. Imagine we have automated our continuous integration, continuous delivery and deployment, or in shortly CICD. This is great, but we want to be able to measure how good this CICD is doing. So we will need to answer some several questions. For example, how often do we successfully release? And what is the amount of time it takes to commit, uh, commit to get to production? Also, what percentage of deployments are causing a failure? And last but not least, how long does it take to recover from a failure? And achieving good results on these points is uh, crucial for the future of CICD. And thank you for being here and for listening to this presentation. So when you are talking about security compliance, you mentioned different tools which you use. So can you tell us more about uh, which of these tools for which component are used? So it's some kind of a mixture because, uh, as I said, we're using a bunch of tools, uh, the check marks, the white source, the, the black duck or Fortify. For example, we are using Fortify to scan our cloud applications and we are using the check marks to scan
scan our JavaScript and some of the Golang application, uh, applications. So there is no one tool for one kind of components. And yeah, the short answer is, answer is it's a mixture. <laughs> mixture. Okay, thank you. And there is another question, which is you mentioned about the four uh, industrial revolutions. How do you think the fifth one will look like? So actually, uh, okay, great question. Um, the fifth industrial revolution actually, some say, started last year in 2020. And it's supposed to be um, this co combination and cooperation between humans and machines. So we're going through some more customiz customization and uh, person personalizations for our digital services and assets. So with this COVID pandemic and situation are already pushing us through this, the fifth industrial revolution that, as I said, it started already. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh